It's a holiday in Baltimore. The kid, the number one prospect in baseball, Jackson Holiday, got the call on Wednesday, makes his debut, and helps the O's to a win over the Red Sox. I'll recap it all and talk about Holiday's role with this team coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Thursday, April 11th, 2024, and welcome back into the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap the Orioles' 7-5 to comeback win over the Boston Red Sox on Wednesday night to clinch the first two games of this three-game series. I'll get you the five things you need to know from this one, including a big home run from Jordan Westberg, another big hit from Colton Kowser, and Keegan Aiken turning into one of the best relievers in the Orioles' bullpen. Plus, of course, we'll talk the big news from Wednesday. Jackson Holiday, the number one prospect in baseball, called up by the O's Wednesday morning, makes his major league debut in this game, didn't get his first hit yet, but did get his first RBI. We'll talk about his performance and what he'll bring to this Orioles team moving forward this season. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by eBay Motors. From brakes to exhaust kits and beyond, eBay Motors has over 122 million parts to keep your ride or die alive. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to bring home that big win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. So let's jump into an Orioles win here. Final score from Fenway Park on Wednesday night, Orioles 7 and the Boston Red Sox 5 as the O's get to 7-4 and four now on the season, 11 games in, and have clinched the series. They have taken the first two from the Sox and will go for the sweep here later on Thursday night. But I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' 7-5 win over the Red Sox. And the first thing you need to know is Jackson Holiday is here. The number one prospect in baseball making his major league debut for the Orioles Wednesday night, hitting ninth, playing second base for the Orioles after getting the call up on Wednesday. And what a moment it was. He makes his debut at Fenway Park. His dad, Matt Holiday, and his whole family were there to see it. And while Jackson didn't light the world on fire in his debut, which is totally fine, there's been plenty of Orioles who really struggled out of the game. Adley Rutschman, Colton Kowser, just to name a few. But he looked like a major league player out there. He goes 0 for 4 with a couple of strikeouts. He played a pretty good defense, I would say. You know, there's some moments, but some good double plays he turned at second base. And he had an RBI. He had a nice piece of major league hit in the sixth inning. Came up with runners on second and third. Nobody out. Orioles trailing 5 to 2. He does what he needs to do. He bounced a ball to the right side, got an RBI ground out, got the other runner up to third with less than two outs. Hey, got his first big league RBI out of the way. That's good to see for Holiday. Next up is that first hit. Hopefully we see it later tonight, but just awesome to see him in the Oriole lineup, see Jackson Holiday in that number seven uniform. Just great to get the debut in. And later in this episode, we'll dive much deeper into the Orioles' move to call up Holiday, what it means for now, what it means for the future, all that good stuff. We'll talk about that coming up. But the takeaway is great that uh, he is here with the Orioles. Second thing you need to know from the O's win on Wednesday night is that Jordan Westberg played hero again. When Jordan Westberg is going to hit a home run, he is going to make sure it counts. Westberg now has two homers on the season. The first one, the two-run walk-off homer against the Royals last Monday night. The second one, a three-run go-ahead shot in the seventh inning that put the O's up 7-5, to five, capping a four-run seventh after a three-run six for the Orioles. They were trailing 5 nothing. This would look dead in the water. Three in the sixth, four in the seventh, three-run homer from Westberg gives the O's the lead that they would not give up, and he crushed that baseball in the seventh inning. 111 off the bat, traveled 432 feet to basically dead center field at Fenway Park. It did go over the monster, but it went over like the toughest part of the monster to get it over, which is right in center field where the monster ends. He got it over there for a home run, would have been a home run per stat cast in all 30 ballparks. That's how you know he absolutely demolished that baseball. Here's the thing about Jordan Westberg right now. His stats 
don't look like insane. He's had some big hits. He's had some good at bats, but he, he's not lighting the world on fire offensively like someone like, say, Ryan Mountcastle has so far this season. And shout out to Mountcastle, who had a couple more hits in Wednesday night's game. But Jordan Westberg's at bats and his quality of contact right now is kind of insane. Through these 11 games for the Orioles, in which Westberg has started 10 of 11 games, he is, whether it's at second or at third, it's probably going to be mostly at third base now with Holiday here, but he is an everyday player for this Orioles team. He is mashing, mashing the baseball right now. Hard hit rate for Jordan Westberg of 66%. That is fifth best in Major League Baseball. Full stop. Now, again, we are two weeks into the season. You got a small sample size. So the names above him are kind of interesting. Miguel Sano, William Contreras, Patrick Bailey, and Bobby Witt Jr. are the four names ahead of Westberg. So it's not exactly like stats have normalized yet. But a 66% hard hit rate is insane. 19 of the 29 balls that Westberg has put in play this season have been hard hit, which means their exit velocity off the bat have been 95 miles per hour or more. He is slamming the baseball. And honestly, he's not getting rewarded enough. Like he should have stats that are like leading the Orioles in multiple categories. That is how well he is striking the baseball right now. It will come around for Holiday. It absolutely will. And I'm excited for the numbers to start going up because the quality of contact has been amazing so far for Jordan Westberg. Third thing you need to know from this game is just <laughs> for what the O's have right now, at least in the big leagues, what we saw on Wednesday was the ideal lineup. And it took a while for them to get going. Cutter Crawford was... I'll say good, the starter for the Red Sox. Now, we mentioned on yesterday's episode that Nick Pavetta, who had planned to start this game, the right-hander who had been great through two starts this year, had a little bit of an elbow issue, like what's new with all these pitchers in Major League Baseball? He goes on the IL. I thought the Red Sox might call somebody up to make a spot start. Instead, they just moved everybody up one day and kept them on regular rest. So Crawford, who was supposed to pitch game three Thursday, ends up starting the Wednesday night game. And he did go five scoreless, which, you know, you'll take that from a starter he also walked four batters, struck out six, and allowed two hits. The Orioles loaded the bases in the fourth and the fifth against Crawford and unfortunately could not score in either inning. They did finally break out in the sixth and seventh against the bullpen. Crawford got a little help, I'll say, from home plate umpire Bruce Dreckman, who seemed like he just wasn't watching the game at one point. 3-0 pitch, two outs, bases loaded. In the fifth to Ryan O'Hearn, a sweeper that was clearly way inside for ball four. Somehow was called strike one. O'Hearn ends up grounding out. The Orioles lose at least one run right there. Luckily, they still win the ball game. Crawford was kind of all over the place, but the Orioles didn't really take advantage. But still, and you saw it when they broke out, seven runs on nine hits in this game. Westberg and Henderson each had three hard hit balls. I mean, I didn't even mention for Westberg. I just talked about him. Yeah, he hit the homer. He also had a double in this game. He was two for three with the homer and three RBIs and three hard hit balls. Henderson had three hard hit balls. Like this lineup, Gunner, Adley, Santander, O'Hearn, Mountcastle, Mullins, Kowser, Westberg, Holiday was the one through nine for the Orioles. I mean, that is just, that is ideal for what the Orioles can do right now. And it's just awesome to watch that lineup up and down. The only two starters who did not get a hit, which is kind of funny in this game. The only two starters for the Orioles who didn't get a hit were Adley Rutschman, and Jackson Holiday. And you know what? Those guys are going to get plenty of hits as this season goes on. I just, I'm feeling really good about this Orioles order and where it at. And that lineup was just, that was chef's kiss when that lineup came out for Wednesday night's game. Fourth thing you need to know from the O's win on Wednesday is that I would think Cole Irvin was good in his second start of the year, but he definitely deserved better than what his pitching line ended up being. Irvin in second start of the season goes five innings, allowing five runs on seven hits with four strikeouts, three walks, and a home run allowed on 78 pitches at Fenway Park on Wednesday night. Only five hard hit balls against him by Red Sox hitters in five innings. I mean, you look at how the runs scored. Like, yeah, there were base runners on in the first and second innings, but Irvin pulled a couple of double plays out of his hat to get out of those innings. And then the third, like he should have been out of there with another zero in the third, gets a pop-up with a runner on first and two outs. Somehow it just falls in the Bermuda Triangle in right center field for the first run to score. Then, you know, he's got second and third, two outs in the fourth, an 0-2 pitch. It was a changeup off the plate. It wasn't a bad pitch, and Connor Wong somehow just kind of poked it into right field for a two-run single. He could have got out of that inning with a zero. And then in the fifth, like Cole Irvin clearly strikes out Rafael Devers looking. 
on a 3-2 pitch. It was two outs. There was nobody on base. He throws a dotted 3-2 sinker at the knees on the corner. Should have been an easy strike three. But as I mentioned before, Bruce Drackman, the home plate umpire, didn't seem like he was really watching the game at times on Wednesday night. He calls it ball four. And then unfortunately, the next batter, Tristan Casas, hits a two-run homer over the monster to make it a 5 nothing game. This easily could have been like a one or two run start for Cole Irvin. Instead, things just didn't bounce his way. I thought in general, his stuff looked better than it did in his first start of the year. Even though he gave up one more run, he only had seven whiffs. I thought he just looked a little crisper on the mound. And that's a good thing. And listen, right, we're, we're getting some good news on John Means. He's on a rehab assignment. We got good news on Kyle Bradish. He's about to start a rehab assignment this week. So Cole Irvin may not be in the rotation for that that much longer. If he can keep the Orioles in games, that's really all he needs to do. And then when one of those guys gets back, Irvin probably goes to the bullpen and makes that unit stronger. So that's where we're at with Cole Irvin. I thought he got unlucky. He looked a little bit better on Wednesday night. And hopefully he continues to just get a little bit better. And he's the five starter right now. He'll be in the bullpen eventually. Just keep the Orioles in games until Means and Bradish can get back. And speaking of the pitching, the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles' 7-5 to win over the Red Sox on Wednesday night is that Keegan Aiken, wow. And I mean, we have been fooled by Keegan Aiken before. Remember how good he was the first couple months of 2022? He was like this relief, multiple innings, Swiss Army knife, incredible weapon for the Orioles that year coming out of the bullpen, and he would just shut teams down for like two and a third every time he went out there. We're starting to see that version of Keegan Aiken again. Now, he was... Not very good last year. And then he had the back injury and missed the entire second half of the year. And Ben McDonald talked about it on the broadcast Wednesday. Like Aiken coming into spring training was on the outside looking at. Like we all assumed he had an option left. He was probably going to start the year at AAA. We we knew he'd pitch for the Orioles at some point this year. I just didn't think he'd make the major league roster. Then he was just lights out in spring training. Other guys struggled. And by the end of spring training, it was like, yeah, Aiken's got a spot in this bullpen. And he got one. And he's, he's it's hard for me sometimes to say nice things about Keegan Aiken, but he has been incredible. So far this year, Aiken, who took over after the Orioles had taken the lead with the Westberg homer in the top of the seventh, he comes in the bottom of the seventh with that 7-5 lead, and he just goes to work. Two scoreless innings for Aiken in high leverage spots. It was a two-run game at Fenway Park where the ball can leave the yard quickly and a game can flip. And he goes two scoreless innings, no hits, four strikeouts. He did walk his first batter of the year facing Devers with two outs in the seventh, but otherwise he was great. Now, Colton Kowser helped him out made two nice catches up against the monster in that eighth inning to help Keegan Aiken get the one, two, three, eighth. But he's throwing strikes again. His stuff looks crisper. It looks better. I mean, the slider is as great as we've ever seen it. Four whiffs on eight swings. That fastball has, I mean, solid velocity. He's 93 to 94. That's the usual Keegan Aiken, but it's still got that good rise to get the swing and miss. And you know, he only dropped in one changeup through 31 pitches, 20 sliders, 10 fastballs, one changeup. We, we've we never seen Keegan Aiken be as slider heavy as he was in Wednesday's outing. And I just continue to be impressed by him. Aiken on the season, five appearances, six and a third innings, two runs, or excuse me, two hits, no runs, nine strikeouts and one walk. He's been great out of that pen and, and he was helped out by the rest of the pen tonight. I mean, shout out to Mike Bauman, who had been terrible this year. And Bauman comes in and although he did allow a hit, he strikes out the side in the sixth inning to keep it a five to three game. And Mike Bauman, who was the ultimate win vulture last year, gets his win first one of the season this year. And then Craig Kimbrell pitching at Fenway Park for the first time since the 2018 World Series when he won with the Red Sox, comes in for the save of the ninth, one, two, three with two strikeouts, dominant 13 pitches to wrap up the win. Just a great night overall for the Orioles. Awesome to see Jackson Holiday on this team and the O's win it seven to five. And the wind's great. All that stuff's great. But Jackson Holiday is here. That's the number one piece of news from today. And coming up next, we're going to talk about Jackson Holiday, his journey to get to the major leagues with the Orioles and, and kind of what he is bringing to the O's, at least at this point, at 20 years old. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Policy Genius. Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace. It saves you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net starting today. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for a million dollars of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. And are you a parent? Are you a caregiver? Are you thinking about life insurance? 
Policy Genius is where you want to go. And they also help you compare your options from top companies. And their team of licensed experts is on hand to really just help talk you through it. So you can check life insurance off your to-do list in no time with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash locked on MLB or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash locked on MLB. And today's episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber and not cash. So with all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible item only, exclusions apply, eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. So the Orioles picked up a 7-5 comeback win over the Boston Red Sox on Wednesday, and they did it with the help of Jackson Holiday, who made his major league debut Wednesday after being called up to the Orioles, first reported by Jeff Passan on Tuesday night and made official by the club on Wednesday morning. Now, if you haven't been paying much attention, which you've been listening to this podcast, I've been talking a lot about Jackson Holiday, but at least I'll give you the quick scoop. On Jackson Holiday, if you're just jumping in now saying, hey, the number one prospect in baseball is on the Orioles, let's jump into the Locked On Orioles podcast. We're happy to have you. Jackson Holiday is a 20-year-old, and that is where we want to begin here. Not many players debut in the major leagues when they are 20 years old, but that is how special of a player Jackson Holiday is. It has been less than two years since he was drafted out of high school as the number one overall pick out of high school in Oklahoma in the 2022 MLB draft by the Orioles. Left-handed hitter, middle infielder, natural position is shortstop, but he'll be playing mostly second base with the Orioles, and again, 20 years old. Now, if you say Holiday, that name seems kind of familiar. Well, he is, of course, the son of Matt Holiday, multiple-time MLB All-Star who played with the Cardinals and the Rockies, among other teams, and had a fantastic career. Jackson basically grew up in clubhouses with his dad, Matt. He was always around from age like four or five, hitting balls, playing catch, He was impressing major leaguers when he was 13 or 14 years old, hitting batting practice uh, with the Rockies and the Cardinals with his dad, Matt Holiday. He's been around baseball for a long, long time and has been ranked the number one prospect in all of Major League Baseball by most, if not every single outlet that covers prospects. Now, I made my opinion clear when the Orioles a couple of weeks ago announced their opening day roster, and it did not include Holiday. He wasn't sent, sent down to AAA to begin the season, and Mike Elias, the Orioles GM, quoted saying, you know, we want him to work more on his defense at second base. We want him to get more at-bats against quality left-handed pitchers in AAA before we feel he is ready to come up to the big leagues. Now, I thought that this would be some sort of service time manipulation from the Orioles. What that means is if you leave a player down in AAA for 16 days or more, that player becomes unable to accrue a full year of service time. The way that free agency works in Major League Baseball is you become a free agent once you have accrued six years of service time. Well, if Jackson doesn't get the full year this year, you get an extra year on the end of his contract. And basically, he would be set to become a free agent after the 2030 season instead of becoming a free agent after the 2029 season. And obviously, that extra year is worth a lot, especially if you're worried you're not going to sign him to a contract extension. But, you know, I was upset the Orioles did that. I thought it was service time manipulation, and I cited multiple things. You know, the Orioles could have played him more at second base last year in the minors. They knew they had Gunnar Henderson at shortstop. They could have made this decision earlier. It's really hard to face quality lefties in the minors because if you are a quality left-handed pitcher, generally you are already in the big leagues. Really the only place to face quality lefties is in the majors. And Jackson Holiday. Mike Elias kept saying he's got a shot, a real shot to make the team out of spring training. He was great in spring training. I felt he did everything he could to make the team. And the other thing was the Orioles rostered a guy like Tony Kemp in his place. They signed Tony Kemp two days before opening day and chose him over Jackson Holiday. And 
Kemp hasn't hit in a couple of years. He literally did not get a hit in an Orioles uniform. Kemp was the corresponding roster move. He was designated for assignment to make room for Holiday on the roster. And Kemp is also a lefty. And now it seems like a lot of the reason the Orioles did send Holiday down, but then called him up now. And again, as I mentioned, it is not service time manipulation because he did not spend the 16 days in the minor leagues. Holiday was only down there for 13 days in AAA, which means as long as he is not sent back down to AAA at any point this season, he will accrue a full year of service time and he will become a free agent after 2029. But what it also means is because of the new prospect promotion incentive or PPI rules in the latest Major League Baseball um, CBA, the Orioles can get a draft pick if Holiday now finishes top two in AL Rookie of the Year voting, similar to how Gunnar Henderson won the award last year and the Orioles got, I believe, the 34th pick in this year's draft. If Holiday wins it or comes in second, the O's will get a pick somewhere in the 30s or 40s in the 2025 draft, which is a very valuable item as well. But I thought it might have been service time manipulation when they set him down. Obviously, it wasn't when they brought him up. So it seems like they did it to just avoid the lefties. Remember, the Orioles faced a left-handed starter in five of their first nine games of this season. And with Holiday, despite his great talent, he is a left-handed hitter. The O's have shown, and a lot of teams have shown, young lefty hitters, eh, you might want to hide them from some big league lefties early. So I get it. But the thing that didn't make sense is, okay, you're going to hold Holiday down for a week and a half to avoid all these lefties. Then when they get to Boston, start playing the righties. That's when you bring up Holiday to make his debut. Okay, I still feel like the team would be better if they just had Holiday from the start, but I get it, whatever, that was the decision. So why did the player you had on the roster instead of him, why was he another left-handed hitter who really can't hit at all? And the Orioles still felt like they were down a hitter when they were facing the lefties. And let me tell you, the Orioles' offense struggled mightily. Now take out, I don't know, they didn't on opening day. They crushed Patrick Sandoval. But in the other four starts against lefties, they struggled a lot offensively. They were missing a right-handed bat. And it just felt like if you're going to sign someone for two weeks, why not have it be like a Hanser Alberto type guy who's not a great hitter, but he hits lefties okay. You play him for two weeks, you DFA him. The Tony Kemp thing didn't really make sense on its face. It is what it is. It's now Jackson Holiday's spot, but he is now here. So maybe it was. Just Holiday was really that good in his 10 games in AAA, and that's all it was. It was 10 games. He got 56 plate appearances. He hit 333 with a 482 on base, a 595 slugging for a 180 WRC plus, which means he was 80% better than a league average AAA hitter. He had two homers and 12 walks to just eight strikeouts. His 93.2 mile per hour average exit velocity was second on the tides. His 57% hard hit rate led the tides in those 10 games. And also, they wanted him to do better against lefties. He had 10 at-bats against left-handed pitching. He went four for 10 with a homer, three RBIs, and zero strikeouts as well. He made a couple errors at second, but generally he played mostly second base and looked solid there defensively. And he played 72 innings at second in these 10 games. He only played 60 total innings at second base last year. So that was a good sign to get him more work there. So maybe... It really just was something that happened in these 10 games, but I kind of doubt that because the way Mike Elias operates, I don't think 10 games in AAA is going to swing his plans and his opinions about his top prospects. I really don't think so. I, I do think what happened here is that the Orioles just wanted to hide him from those early lefties. It just didn't make sense. They didn't just go get another righty for 10 days instead of getting Tony Kemp. Oh, well, Jackson's here. That's the important part. AAA last year, we know how good he was when he came up. Right, hit 267, 109 WRC plus. Double A last year before the promotion to triple A, 36 games, hit 338 with a 154 WRC plus. Remember, he started 2023 in low A Del Marva. He crushed Del Marva, he crushed Aberdeen, he crushed Boot, and he crushed Norfolk at the end of the 2023 minor league season. After getting picked first overall out of high school in 2022, remember, he's still 20 years old. His quality of contact got way better in AAA in the 10 games this year than it was last year. He hit lefties better. Just everything got better. And the Orioles now still eligible for that draft pick. So that's where we are. He just demolished the minor leagues. Yes, he's 20 years old, but he's ready. He makes the Orioles better right away. And that's what's happening. He's on this Orioles team and he makes this team better. So now the question is, okay, how much better does he make them? And what is his role, both in the short term and in the long term this year for the Orioles? We'll talk about that to finish off the pod coming up next. 
But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and the NHL, baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets, guaranteed. That's $150 win or lose. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that is safe, secure, and super easy to use. So what are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to make your first bet an automatic win at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So Jackson Holiday is here. Joining the Orioles on Wednesday, making his major league debut, picking up his first MLB RBI, and he is certainly a special talent. Number one prospect in baseball, looking at the fan graphs, kind of scouting report for Jackson Holiday. The grading is on the 20 to 80 scale, 80 being just tippy top, one of the greatest players you've ever seen. They set his future value at a 70. That means he's going to be an all-star. That's what they think. The hit tool, they say right now at 45, could go up to 60. The power right now at 50, up to 60. The running at 50, the fielding at 40 to 50, the throwing at 50. It's just a well-rounded player. And, and I recommend you after listening to this episode to go listen to the episode of Baseball Barbicast from Jake Mintz and Jordan Schusterman over at Yahoo Sports on Wednesday. They broke down the holiday call-up. And, and Jake had a great just chat about how Jackson Holiday doesn't have one tool that like crazy stands out. If you think about it, there's a lot of other players where they've got this tool that's like insane. These other top prospects, like someone like Kobe Mayo, the power is insane. Heston Kerstad, the power is insane. Like Connor Norby, the hit tool to all fields is just otherworldly. Colton Kowser, it's like the patience that he shows at the plate is just this fantastic tool. Holiday has really good patience, yes, but there's not this like glaring giant tool you're going to see. He just does everything really well. And that's awesome to have on your team. And he's just such an advanced player. That is why he is here right now. You look at how long each of the other two number one prospects spent in the minor leagues. Of course, Adley Rutschman, Gunnar Henderson, and then Jackson Holiday. Three years in a row, the Orioles had the number one prospect in baseball. Now they were all on the major league team. Gunnar had 295 plate appearances in AAA before he was called up. Adley had 238. Jackson Holiday had just 147 AAA plate appearances before he was called up. Now, some of that has to do with the Orioles just a better team, more in win-now mode than they were when they called up Gunner and Adley back in 2022. But he is a special, special player that just fast-tracked his way through the minor leagues. So now he's in the big leagues, and the question is, okay, what now? What we saw on Wednesday, at least lineup-wise, defensive-wise, is what we'll see for a little while here. Adley and Gunner each hit sixth, basically, when they were called up in 2022. It took Adley about two months to move up to the number two hole. For Gunner, he hit like fifth or sixth when he was called up in September for basically the rest of the year in 2022. Then he moved up the order a little bit when he uh, got back in 2023. But for Holiday, there's not as much pressure to hit up in the lineup because this Orioles lineup, as I mentioned before, is so stacked right now. There's so much talent. He might hit ninth for a while, and that's okay. He'll probably hit seventh, eighth, or ninth for a good chunk of the first half of this season, just as he settles in. Now, he might play a little bit of shortstop if Gunnar Henderson gets a day off, but generally his position will be mostly second base when he is out there defensively, and he can play that position at a solid level as well. Again, he'll hit seventh, eighth, or ninth, and, and I could totally see it by the second half of this season, Jackson Holiday hitting the top third of the order because he is that special. But for a couple months now, they'll take the pressure off him, hit him seventh, eighth, or ninth, and just let him kind of settle in at the major league level. Now, what we saw lineup wise on Wednesday is generally what we're now going to see when the Orioles face a right-handed starter. I think Henderson, Rutschman, the whole nine yards, Santander, O'Hearn, Mountcastle, Mullins, Kowser, Westberg, and Holiday. That's a great lineup. Now, against lefties, there is still a question of how Jackson Holiday fits in. Now, the the most recent lineups against lefties had Adley Rutschman DHing, so it'd be Henderson at short, Rutschman at DH, Mountcastle at first, Santander in right, Westberg at third, Hayes in left, Mullins in center, and then James McCann would catch, and then Jorge Mateo playing second base. I would think, even though James McCann's had a big hit this year, I, McCann's will still play against some lefties because that's how they'll find ways to give Adley at least a half day off at DH. But when it's, you know, a weeknight game and there's a lefty on the mound and Adley is fine to catch, doesn't need the day off, I think we could see Jackson Holiday in there at the DH spot. I think we could really see where it's still the Henderson, Rutschman, Mountcastle, Santander, Westberg, and Hayes. 
And then maybe we see Mullins seventh and center. And then I would think Holiday gets to DH potentially against the lefty hitting eighth. And then you keep Mateo in there hitting ninth and playing second base because he's just been really good hitting against lefties this year and for the last couple of years. Even when the bat overall has been bad, I still trust Mateo up there against lefties. But you have to make a decision still. And I talked about this in the offseason. Like one of these young left handed hitters, whether it's Kowser, whether it's Holiday, whether it's Kerstad at some point, or maybe someone like Ryan O'Hearn is going to have to face lefties consistently for the O's to put their best lineup out there. They still could, you know, put Ramona Rios in the lineup against lefties. But I just think you got Holiday here. Maybe not start him against every lefty early, but give him some chances down the lineup, DH or second base against some lefties, get him in there and let him go to work because overall talent wise, you put holiday in there, even against a lefty that is giving you your best chance to win with your most talented players out there. I think Kowser will get some chances against some lefties, maybe at DH as well. They'll still give McCann and, and Arias some at bats in those spots, but holiday is just going to start playing more and more against lefties while he plays every day against righties. And again, by the time we get to June, You'll just see Jackson Holiday, I think, in there as the everyday second baseman for the Orioles. And that is certainly going to be fun to watch as well. But what a day. What a day in Birdland. Holiday comes up or get a comeback win. It is all good stuff for the O's as they clinch the series against the Red Sox. And now they go for the sweep at Fenway Park. It's another night game on Thursday. I would expect a very similar Orioles line. Trying to go for the sweep on Thursday night, another 7, 10 p.m. Eastern time start. Grayson Rodriguez toes the mound for his third start of the season for the Orioles, trying to build off two great starts to begin the year. And he will go up against the right-hander Garrett Whitlock, another starter who has just been insane for the Red Sox so far in two starts. He's got a .96 ERA. He went five innings of one-run ball his last time out with eight strikeouts against the Mariners. We'll see what the O's can do against him on Thursday night. And then I'll be back with you on Friday. Be recapping the final game between the Orioles and the Red Sox. I'll get you ready for the weekend series between the O's and the Brewers. Holiday's home debut facing off against D.L. Hall, who's starting for the Brewers Friday night. That'll be fun. We'll get to all that coming up on tomorrow's episode and also get you another update on Kyle Bradish as well. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.